Welcome everyone. This is the Top 1% Sellers Academy and I am very excited to have with us today Mike Weinberg. We're going to find out a bit more about Mike in a few seconds, but I want to make sure you're able to see my screen and uh, you are uh, some of the very first people that are seeing the launch of the Top 1% Sellers Academy. Uh, we have basically um, accumulated an amazing lineup of uh, sales experts starting with people like Mike and other people that you'll see here on this uh, platform uh, that will house a number of very exclusive conversations with some top sales experts from across the industry. Um, and in addition to that, you'll be able to actually access uh, certification content on top 1%. As you can see here, you know, we have people like Jim Cathcart, uh, Mike himself, Louis Chef, Jeffrey Hazley, Peter Myers, Ty Bennett, Tim Sanders, Stephanie Bova, and a lot of other people that we will be adding to the website on an ongoing basis. Uh, once you become a member as well, you'll have access to a number of top sales coaches that you can work with, and you can choose to work with them one-on-one -on -one or maybe bring them into your organization, um, and a lot more. And I, I'm not going to take too much time from my conversation with Mike, but definitely explore the site, explore the store and the shop that's available on the site and uh, you know, give us feedback. We're hoping it will be an amazing sales enablement and professional development tool for you, as well as for your colleagues. Uh, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and stop this, uh, the, the share here. And again, Mike, welcome. And I wanna let the audience know, uh, we are literally in the company of, 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 great, of greatness with Mike. He is the author of two very well-known books, uh, Sales Management Simplified, as well as New Sales Simplified. Uh, Mike is a sales professional at heart who has now, for a number of years now, he has basically been uh, uh, doing his own sales coaching and consulting business. He really kind of splits his time between consulting and speaking, and we're going to actually find from him today uh, some real-life examples of how he works with his clients. We'll take a look at a three segments to this conversation. First, we'll focus on situations with, where he works with his clients on developing top performers. We're going to make sure he shares with you his own insights on what makes a top performer. And then in the second segment, we'll take a look at how sales managers can really kind of set the, set the conditions for success for the team members. You know, what kind of role should they embody and what they should be doing on a daily basis. And then the very last segment, and, and I think that segment will be very, very useful for a lot of the organizations that you are a part of, how can a company make sure that the sales organization is really set up for success? So with that, Mike, welcome. I'm really excited Thank to have you, you with Ash. us. Thank you, Ash. It's fun to be here. You've had some great guests, and I appreciate the overly generous introduction. So looking forward to it. Absolutely, absolutely. And so let's definitely kind of jump right into it. And uh, I would really love, and as I mentioned, you know, like to make sure this is a very unique conversation. Uh, would love to give the listeners uh, examples where the key dynamic that was missing in one of, in some of your client engagements was the fact that the company was struggling with the fact that the, the sales professionals on the team were not really performing at their best. Would love to kind of find out from you some examples of these situations and then how do we kind of turn things around and help the listeners understand what it takes to become a top performer, a top one percenter. Yeah, that's a big question. I could take a, a number of angles at that. Usually, and unfortunately, I'm usually called in when they're not performing at their best. Yes. Maybe it's, it's one out of 20 times where I get the phone call where it's a company that's doing great and they're firing on all cylinders and, and they're, they're looking to take it to the next level. Yes. Usually it's when results are not optimal or something's going on. So I, I can relate to that. Um, I, I'm going to approach it for, uh, from a couple different directions. Um, Sometimes when the sales team is not getting the results that are desired, it's because the sales roles have not been well-defined. And quite often we find that companies have the wrong people in the wrong sales roles. And I'll circle back and we could talk more about that. In general, though, I'll throw this out to start. Yes. There are a lot of people in sales roles today who have survived or thrived for a really long time. Um, in a reactive mode, taking care of business that was given to them, responding to demand that comes their way. And they do fine when there's lots of demand to manage. They don't do so well when they're asked to go out and hunt and look for stuff to kill. 
sometimes because they're not wired that way, sometimes because they don't know how. So that's, that's a whole category in and of itself, getting the right people uh, in the right roles. Um, I'll stick on the sales leadership uh, angle on this too. Yes. Um, I get called into a lot of companies where either the sales culture is off or the salespeople, it's not just that they're not respected or treated well, it's that the company forgets their primary job. And I have been in multiple companies where um, the, there was a high growth goal, but management tasked the salespeople and, and kind of weighed them down with all this low value activity. Um, they did a lot of customer service work. They would deliver parts. And some of my industrial dis distribution type companies where uh, it was common to ask the salesperson to go run something out to a customer. Well, that, that's a, you know, that's a $10 an hour delivery job. Not right. We want someone who's making a lot more than that. So, so um, asking them to do things that aren't sales related or not respecting them. Um, certainly, the, and as long as I'm on that topic, um, sales culture. Uh, I, I say this a lot, um, and your audience may have heard me say this somewhere else. Uh, a miserable accountant can do great work. You don't have to love your job as an accountant. You don't have to have your heart engaged. Yes. Every month you can produce on time, accurate statements. But show us, Ash, the, the sales guy, sales gal, who yeah. doesn't have their heart engaged, doesn't love what they do, doesn't have passion. They're not going to succeed. And yet in so many companies, and I've been in, I, I, and I'll tell you some stories of where management was anti-sales and they would micromanage and they would um, do everything to deflect the credit when the sales team did great. And yet when, um, the, when sales were poor, they would blame the salesperson. Yes. So it was very hard to keep the, the team energized and focused regardless of how hard we train them because management didn't appreciate them. So I'll pause there. And that, that's a whole other conversation, really. Uh, absolutely. And I think, you know, if you want to then kind of go back to that top, you know, that uh, sales professional, and you want to really make sure that they really em embrace the fact that they really uh, own their own destiny. And with that in mind, um, you know, what would be, I know that in, in your book, you talk about the not so sweet, you mm -hmm. know, 15 reasons salespeople fit to, to, to draw, you know, to get new business. And maybe we can just give them a few nuggets from those uh, that will help them really, really understand that it really, it's it, this, the buck stops with them. They own it. Yeah. Well, why don't we start with that reason? In fact, I'll bring up that one first since you, you yes. went there. Yeah. In chapter two of New Sales Simplified, I list these 16 reasons that, uh, salespeople don't get more new business, why they fail when it yeah. comes to bringing on net new business. And what's interesting from watching all these salespeople, a lot of them are really good people and really talented sellers, and they excel at different parts of selling, service, relationship management, uh, in the insurance world, retention, uh, project management, but they don't do so well when it comes to hunting and to bringing in, in new pieces of business. And the, and the one you brought up, yeah. um, there are a lot of people in sales roles, Ash, that they don't take responsibility for their own results. Um, I have a client, I can't name the client, yes. but I did a, a workshop for them. I kicked sales kickoff in January and I'm doing some ongoing work. And when I told them about the salesperson who's really good at pointing the finger and they'll blame everybody, they'll blame their boss, they'll blame the factory, they'll blame the customer, they'll blame the competitor, they'll blame Obama, now they'll blame Trump, they'll yeah. blame their mother. They, they never take, it's never their fault. It's the territory. It's someone else's fault. When I, when I share that story, the executive whispered in my ear, he said, we, and I won't say the name of the company, but he says, we call that the ABC company salute. Yeah. Everyone is really good at pointing the fingers, but they don't look in the mirror or, or point back at themselves. And, and I don't know how you, your perspective on this. I have never seen a really highly successful salesperson who sees themselves as a victim and just, uh, uh, you know, that their success is totally circumstantial. In fact, I'm going to, it's so funny. I just had, I just had, I was going, this is my friend, Anthony Anarino's book. Yes. It's a phenomenal book. The forward I wrote, it's average. The rest of the book is really great, except for the stupid title, because it's not the only sales guide. You need my books and Anthony's books, book. of course. Yeah. yeah. But you know what? He, the guy is brilliant. He may be the smartest guy in, in the sales business today. And, and much of the premise of the book is sales success is not situational. It's yeah. based on the seller. And we know it's not the product, it's not the company, it's not the market, it's the salesperson. So I never see someone produced at a high level in, unless they own the results. Uh, I'll give you another one. Um, not owning your calendar. That's probably one of the most prevalent reasons. Salespeople come to work and they forget their primary job 
and they, and they fill their day up doing all kinds of well-meaning things and playing good corporate citizen and going to meetings and helping out their friends, but they don't time block their calendar. They don't set aside uh, dedicated blocks of time to prospect, to work on new business. And the truth is nobody defaults to prospecting mode. No one you know, has five minutes and go, oh, I'll call a few prospects. If you don't put the time in your calendar and guard that time, it's never gonna happen. And, and a lot of my big clients, I've got I'm thinking of one in particular right now, yes. um, up in New England, it's, it's almost a game to see who can invite you to more meetings. And there's people in your company looking to see, they go in your calendar and looking to see if you have a slot open. And yeah. if you do, they wanna drag you into some meeting they think you should attend. And by the way, I think letting people do that to your calendar is the dumbest thing that's ever happened. So the, the only way to combat that is you got to get in your calendar first and make appointments with yourself to work on your high value activities, making phone calls, connecting on LinkedIn, uh, sending out emails, scheduling, you know, research time where you're going to figure out who you need to pursue and then actually executing and picking up the phone and, and making those calls. So there's a couple, uh, not taking responsibility, um, not owning your calendar, um, I'll give you another one that's probably as prominent as any. Uh, I see salespeople that can't tell their story. Uh, they can't articulate value. They don't have passion when they talk about their solution. Uh, when they do talk about, uh, when they do their little pitch or they tell their story, it's very boring. It's very self-focused. They talk about their company and how long they've been in business and they show organization charts. Um, it's, it's a mess. It's always kind of boring and self-focused and not compelling. And they do a terrible job articulating the real reasons that customers buy from them. Because exactly. the truth is, especially when you're prospecting, no one cares about your company and what you're trying to sell them. They only care about their issues. They've got outcomes exactly. they're trying to achieve. They've got pains. They've got problems. And we need a really strong, succinct, compelling, and customer issue-focused story that communicates. So I spend a lot of time with clients working on how do we fix our story. So there's just a handful of, of those 16 reasons. Yeah, and, I, and I'd like to maybe, you know, take that a step further when you just said that you work with clients on helping them develop what that value proposition is, sort of a customer-focused value proposition. How, how do, you do you go about that with the client? And I, I want the listeners to sort of understand that that's the rigor they're going to have to follow in order to get... The, Great word, yeah. rigor, because it's, e it's not easy, Ash. Yeah. It's probably the ugliest exercise I do with the sales team. In fact, when I'm doing this in a workshop, in a room, whether it's a small group of, you know, a dozen or so, or it could be a room of a couple hundred people, we're going to do a, the exercise to start drafting their story. I put up a picture of sausage being made and I make the point this, you're not going to like me and you're not going to enjoy this exercise because it's not fun to, to work through because it's not natural to talk about your, your sales story. And I'll give you an example of that in a second. So, so I love the fact that you use the word rigor. It, it's going to take you some time in a, in, a, in a meeting room and then doing some homework after to go through a few iterations of your story. Because what tends to happen when I'm in a room full and I, I, I have a large heavy equipment manufacturer uh, who's a client. Yes. And they've been in business 100 years. It's a brand everybody's heard of. Their logo is very familiar. Um, and the people that work there are very proud. Their product's made in America. Many of the people that are the dealerships that sell this heavy equipment have been in business forever, generation after generation. So when I ask them, hey, tell me your story. How do you, if you met someone, they said, tell me about your business or what do you do? What would you say? And they always say things like, our product's made in America. It always has been. We've been in business 100 years. Uh, we're the best at this. You know, I... I I, my family was, have been doing this for four generations. And I look at them and I say, you know what, that's wonderful. And I'm glad that makes you feel good. But the truth is that means nothing to your prospect. I mean, it's nice. And I would, I would get to that at some point in my story. But why don't we lead with the issues that are on their mind, exactly. right? They have got problems they're trying to solve. They have opportunities they're trying to capture. They have employees they're trying to make more productive. They have product that needs to get transported. They have costs they're trying to reduce. They have profits they're trying to increase. They have customers they're trying to make happy. How does your solution address those things? Exactly. So, so I'll, I'll just go on one more second here. So yes. generally, and I'll, I'll use my own business as an example. Yes. If someone said, Mike, what do you do? Tell me about your business. And that's a common question we all get asked. If I wasn't thinking or I was being lazy, 
I would say, Ash, uh, thanks for asking. Yeah. I'm a consultant. I'm a speaker. I do some sales training. I've got some great books. Let me tell you about my books. Yes. And the problem with that entire answer is it means nothing. It's totally self-focused. Yeah. And unless I happen to be talking to someone on the day, they're looking for a sales consultant, which is like never. Right. <laughs> is, right. It falls on deaf ears. But what if I said, and this is, I'm going to give you guys two lines that I think would be really helpful. And all of this is in chapter eight of New Sales Simplified. Yes. If you start your story by either saying, we help blank, we help customer type or position type. So we help manufacturers or we help CFOs. Who? Yes. Or I like to say, they turn to us when. So I'll use my business example. Uh, I work with senior executives. Senior executives look to me when. Their sales team's not firing on all cylinders. Results aren't what they should be. Uh, the sales team's living in reactive mode. They're showing up late to opportunities. They're selling on price. They're getting commoditized. Uh, sales management's looking for some fresh ideas and outside perspective on building the type of winning, high-performance sales culture they want. Okay, yeah. I'll just stop there. I threw out four reasons that customers buy from me. Yes. What I know is that any CEO or senior executive I'm talking to has those issues. And that's why I bring those up first. And it immediately has them lower their guard and now they want to talk to me. Because exactly. instead of seeing me as a consultant who's pitching, they see me as someone who solves those issues for someone else. That are so common any, to him as well. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, they're common to his situation as well, you know, quite possibly. Absolutely, and the, the natural reaction, if I list four or five issues that I address for my clients, just like when any salesperson structures their messaging that way, the yeah. very natural next question is they go, hmm, I've got a couple of those issues. Tell me a little bit more or how do, how do, how do you guys work? And then you're in a dialogue. Exactly. exactly. And, but when you lead with your product and you brag about how different you are and how great your company is, everybody's defenses go up Absolutely. and you sound like a salesperson who's pitching, not like a consultant or an expert who's there to help and wants to talk about it. Exactly. And the conversation turns off and they walk away. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. no, that this was fantastic. And I think, um, you know, I, I just want to let people know who are, who are basically watching us live, definitely drop your questions in the Q and a window and, and I'll definitely share these questions with Mike. Um, I, I definitely believe Mike, and I know you are the chief sales officer for your own business, as you just exactly said. And I think everybody who is a top performer is essentially running their own franchise, you know, you have been giving a book of business or they need to go out and make that book of business and create yeah. it. And then the next step they have to do is sort of go through this process of, I need to figure out what my message is, right? Um, in, in, in a lot of examples, when you've done that for clients, how do you work with them on the rollout to make sure that everybody gets to really embody that languaging? That's a great question. The, the best way is get them involved on the front end so they feel like they're contributing to shaping the story. It's not just the executive team and me. It's, we're going to get input from everyone who sells. And, and gather all these talking points together. And then as a team, we're going to do some wordsmithing and some editing, and then and we'll get it back to them. Um, the rollout is really where the, the rubber meets the road because we can do these exercises on sharpening the talking points. But what I really like to do is go to the next step where we then give examples and show salespeople how to get that story or pieces of that story yes. into their prospecting calls and into their voicemail messages, and into their emails, and into their sales calls, and definitely into their presentations. Yes. Um, so it's, it's, it's taking the hard work you do where you're going through this really, you know, the sausage making exercise, yes. and then you're giving them some examples of how other companies use their story, and then let asking, and I, I literally will do this, I'll ask the salespeople, we'll give them some examples, we'll work through their story, and I'll ask them to get me back a couple voicemails, uh, a couple telephone call outlines, a couple emails, a couple PowerPoint slides they might use, and then we'll talk through how to best deploy those. And then, and then you get comfortable because yeah. you know the problem with training and anytime you try something new, you're, you're not really comfortable and you're not good at it. But you know what happens if you try it a few times? All of a sudden, it gets a little more familiar and you start having success with it. And you go, oh, this is pretty good. It's and then funny. you do something five times, 10 times, 20 times, and eventually it's natural. And that's what I see happening with a lot of salespeople. But it's, it's like you said, it takes work. It yeah. doesn't happen unless you want it to happen. Exactly. And then, and yeah. then I love what you said about how, you know, having them co-created with you so that it, they own it. And then they start really implementing it. And I'm sure in that process, you, you also take a look at everybody who's touching that customer conversation. 
the people that are doing sales administration, the people that are doing outbound calls, um, outbound marketing, that all of that needs to connect. All those people. In fact, I'm doing a, a next week, I'm, I'm going out to Arizona for a client that's having their, their uh, big annual sales meeting. And the main topic is how do we upgrade from being just a commodity seller and treated like a vendor to, uh, to being treated like a true value creator? And one of the main themes is how do we articulate our story? Yeah. And this company is in a business, I, I don't want to say the type of business, but it's the ultimate commodity. And it's yeah. something everybody's trying to have done through purchasing and everybody wants to squeeze every tenth of a penny out of the, the high volume that they sell. And the, and the senior executive, the chief sales officer, I give him so much credit. He's having me speak for the first half hour to the entire company. Yes. And he wants me to talk about the importance of their messaging and the story. And then I'm going to get a few hours alone with the sales team to work even harder on the story and get that story incorporated into phone calls, into sales calls, et cetera. So yes, yeah, that's, that's good. I'm, I'm glad we kind of give people, you know, some sense of what happens in the background. Um, I'd love before we close out this segment, I know you and I spoke before about X as a service and how in a lot of businesses, even non high tech businesses, uh, more and more, very much like your business, you're really selling the invisible because people don't get to see what it is until they see the outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, as top performers try to function in this new world where most of them have been used to, um, they sell this sort of physical product and they work with uh, the people that are going to ship it out. They, they, they understand it's very physical and it's very concrete to them. Um, now they sign, they get the deal signed. There's nothing that's going to basically be shipped, right? right? Someone has to sort of provision this online system and make it available for the client. Uh, for that sales professional, what can we share with them from the professional services selling world? That's really a great question. Uh, I would say in that environment, it is even more important to really understand your client's perspective because it's like you said, you're, there's no product that's shipping. Yes. So you need to take on almost their persona and put their eyes as your filter of what are they seeing now that they've committed to this this significant project and some of them have as and I have clients in the SaaS space as as do you, yes. you know, where they're signing up for this this pretty large initialization fee or customization to get the project going and then there's going to be this on mon ongoing monthly recurring bill they're going to get for the for how they use the system yes uh, you need to have an appreciation for the fact of what is that customer thinking and 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 that and this is where it gets I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth because one of the biggest issues in sales is salespeople don't let go of the sale and they want to overserve the customer and that comes at the expense of finding new business. But I would say, and I like how you said it, it said X as a service world. Yes. It's really important that we get the customer off to a good start because there's always this hassle as we're getting our teams together when we're doing the integration or it never goes as smoothly as hoped and there's always some fear on their side. And in those cases, it's, I think you got to hold the customer's hand to make sure that they're comfortable and you need to continue to ask them, what are you scared about right now? Yeah. Right? What are you, what are you concerned about? What is the pressure you I had a phone call this morning with a senior executive client who has an issue with his board of directors and the way we're doing this current engagement with his distribution group is not working exactly as we planned. Yes. And he said to me, I'm feeling some heat from the board. And I looked at him back and I said, then we need to change how we're approaching this. Yeah. It's because we wrote the plan one way. Now that we're a few months into this and we're seeing reality, we should change it. And he said, I would appreciate that. And I said, of course. Yeah. Same thing as the seller yeah. selling a service. You have to manage the customer's expectations and you need to see what they're seeing and sense the pressure that they're feeling. And that's really the best way I could describe it. Absolutely. Fantastic, yeah. Mike. Well, thank you so much for, for these amazing, amazing insights. And what I'd like to do now for our audience is really kind of shift gear and really kind of come up with another vantage point, which is the vantage point of what does a sales team manager need to do in order to succeed? And again, we're going to use examples where you stepped into a situation where the sales management team wasn't doing it the right way and you came up with some ideas for them to kind of help unlock the potential that's on the team maybe we we'll start with some common pitfalls you, you see with your clients when it comes to what sales managers um, do and should not be doing yeah well thank I, thank you for the softball uh that's an easy one um, <laughs> and, I, and i don't i don't get any credit for this this is just what's going on in the world 
um, I wrote my second book, Sales Management Simplified, angry. And mostly I was angry at senior executives who kept calling in people like me to come train their sales team and fix their sales problem. And the truth is, in most of those organizations, yes, the salespeople could do better. And I'm happy to always do coaching on the story and prospecting and consultative sales calls and putting a business plan together and strategic targeting and spending more time hunting. And I get paid. That's most of my revenue is doing that. I love it. Yes. But the truth is that in most cases, the bigger issue is sales leadership and sales talent management and sales culture. And I look I, and I've learned to look back at the executive and say, before we go down this path and spend all this money and all this time training the salespeople, let me hold up this little mirror and let's look at your people and your culture and how you're treating the team and your compensation plan and how your sales manager is spending his or her time. And all of a sudden, it's a different dialogue. And I'll give you a, a very concrete example. Yes. This is from a few years ago. It was actually a company in my own town where I was doing some consulting and I was engaged by the senior executive to be the coach to the director of sales who was leading the North American sales team. And um, the, I was warned that this person was not very experienced at sales management and needed significant help. Yes. And it took a very long time to get that meeting scheduled with the director of sales. And I tell this story in, I think it's chapter three or chapter four in, in sales management simplified. Um, and I should have known how hard it was to get the meeting scheduled that this guy was really overwhelmed. Well, once I got in his office and I sat down, the problem was not that he didn't have experience as a sales manager. The problem was that his company was trying to kill him. I mean, literally kill him. He had 22 direct reports, no administrative help. Uh, his company made him go to like four or five different company-wide meetings every week. Strategy meetings, product meetings, uh, operations planning meetings. It was ridiculous. And about halfway into my first conversation with him, I said, let me just ask you a couple questions to get a handle on how you're doing with your main job which is not attending those meetings. Your main job is leading the sales team to drive new revenue. Exactly. Yeah. And I asked him very simple questions. Tell me how often you get out in the field to work with your people. He said, I don't. I said, I asked how often. He said, I don't. Wow. I said, okay, tell me about sales team meetings. When do you do a team conference call? When do you share some information? When, oh, we're not doing any of those. Okay, tell me about your one-on-one -on -one conversations, which is, I think, the highest the single highest value activity for any sales manager is a one-on-one -on -one meeting with each salesperson. And part of that meeting should be accountability where we're looking at results and we're looking at the pipeline and if necessary activity. Yes. And then the other part of that meeting or a separate meeting would be coaching where we're asking questions, we're giving feedback, we're doing deal reviews, exactly. trying to help them up their game. Yeah, exactly. And when I asked the same manager, I said, okay, well, you're not going out in the field and you're not having team meetings, you're doing all these other things. What about one-on-one? -on -one? How, how often do you talk to everybody to go over results, pipeline? And he said, I don't. I can't do it. Wow. And then I said, we have found the problem in our first conversation. And it's not because I'm some guy that is brilliant. I yeah. mean, anyone who knows anything about sales leadership would be like, huh, you spend all your time doing all these corporate things. You don't meet with your people. You don't have team meetings. You don't go see customers. You don't watch people work. That's the job. Man, that's not extra. That is the job. So the battle was convincing him how to get out of all this stuff because he took me over to his desk and he showed me his calendar with yeah. all these appointments and he, he this was a company that wanted him involved in every decision so he was getting 250 emails a day yes wow. Ash, that's not tenable that's not survivable so he just saw me this is the frustration so i was coming in and to him it was just another meeting it's more i'm like no i'm trying to get work off your desk one more, yeah. And the battle ended up being with his boss, not with him, trying to show them this is not going to get you what you want sales-wise. Absolutely. So, and, and, and I yeah. think, you know, it would be interesting because people listen. And let's say if I'm a sales professional and I'm in that situation where my manager is like that, and I, I, I need to get the message across to that manager, is it a direct way? Do you think it should be a direct conversation with him or should I find a third party influencer? In this wow, situation? that's a hard one. You yeah. know, here's what I found. It's yeah. really hard to change sales culture from the bottom. Yeah. If the senior executives don't understand the priorities and the manager doesn't understand the priorities, it's really dangerous for the salesperson to try to coach up and yes. teach the manager, you know, I really need you. I need you to hold me accountable. I would love you to travel with me. I'd love to do deal reviews. 
it would be really nice if our team meetings actually energized and equipped us yes. instead of you taking these cheap shots at us. You know, it's all, I'll just jump in here. Sales team meetings. Yeah. My litmus test is really simple. Do the salespeople leave the sales team meeting more energized, better aligned, and better equipped to do their job? When you walk out, are you more energized and more ready to do your job or less energized? Exactly. And, and you know, uh, most sales team meetings are awful. They're boring. Managers take cheap shots at salespeople. It's like a cheap way to do accountability because they don't do the one-on-ones. Yes. I think you do tough accountability in private in a one-on-one. -on -one. You don't do it in front of the team. You use the team meeting to share successes, to create competition, to do some role play, to exactly. practice, right? I mean, there's all this stuff that you could be, you know, doing that would bring value and energize the team. So that, that I forgot what got me going on the sales team meeting thing, but that would be valuable. If I could get, if, I would have so much less business. Yes. If sales managers met one-on-one -on -one to review results and then pipeline and then activity, if they led better team meetings and if they got their ass out of the office and their head out of the CRM screen and they actually coached and watched their people. Amazing, amazing things would happen. Absolutely. And I, and I want to give people listening in again, uh, you know, some tips on uh, very, very diplomatically, you know, going back to the first conversation we had, just be about being sort of the person that's owning it and running it and really being basically owning their own destiny that they can say to the sales manager, I'm looking for it out one on one on one. Here are some of the things that I'd love to cover and indirectly more literally shaping up the conversation. Right. So they can they can get the guidance that they are looking for. Um, uh, any tips on what that agenda would look like? Which agenda for uh, for the coaching con conversations, the one on one conversation, to, for it to be really effective for the sales? Yeah, I, I think I think I'll give you two pieces to it. Yeah, I think part I think it's always better when we start with results because in sales we get paid for results. We don't get paid to work. Yeah. So I think it's always good to set the stage to look at a salesperson and say, okay. Let's go back to your goal. What were you trying to do this quarter or this month or this year? How much money were we trying to make? What, are, what was it going to take in terms of number of deals and revenue or margin to get there? So we, we're all in the same place starting point. And I think from there, it's an easy pivot to the pipeline and go, okay, do we have enough in the funnel right now to get you what you need? Yes. I think if you can establish that baseline first, then everyone's open up to coaching because then you could go, okay, let's be honest. Yes. You're not on track to hit your goal, and I'm looking in the funnel, and you and I both know we don't have enough healthy deals in here to get you where you need to go. Okay. So now we can start coaching. Let's deconstruct. Yes. Let's talk about your calendar. Let's talk about your target account list. Are you spending your time on accounts that can move the needle, or are you just doing busy work? Are you coming in every day and starting out by cleaning your, e your email box yes. and hanging out with your friends talking about fantasy football, or exactly. you know, right now it's March Madness, NCAA brackets, and all that stuff? Yeah. Or are you spending an hour and a half in the morning working on new business development and you can put the other stuff off till later in the day? Tell me about your, your story. Are you articulating value? Let me hear what you're saying to get a meeting. What are we saying when we get a meeting? Let's, let me go on a couple sales calls with you. What's happening when we get in there? Are you doing good discovery? Are yeah. you building rapport? Are you defining a next step? Like I, I think you, can, you, can, you have salespeople much more open to feedback and coaching when you can show them here's where you are yes. versus results. And you know, top guys, even when they're killing their numbers, they always want coaching Absolutely. because they want to get better. And that's been my most surprising of the 10 years I've been doing this or so. I'm always amazed that even though the salespeople at the top are very selfish right. in a good way to protect their time, yeah. if you've got an idea that's going to help them make more money, exactly. they want it. Yeah. They're not scared. It's Absolutely. the guy in the middle who's struggling, who's insecure, that's the one who hides from the coach and doesn't want you to look at what they're doing. Yes. It's fascinating. Yeah. Very good point. Because I think for the, for the top salesperson, it's always the, uh, the joy of the pursuit. I mean, they like the challenge. When it's too easy, you know, it's almost, it's not that attractive for them anymore. They always want it to be hard and uh, really uses their smarts and their intelligence. And if you can give them more nuggets, they are more than willing to, uh, to listen to it. Well, and that's where I get all my nuggets from. Let me be really honest. Yeah. I wasn't born with these ideas. I'm taking them from the best. Every time I go in a company, I generally think the top salesperson could probably outsell me. Yes. In most companies, uh, the top seller is incredible. Now, I know more about sales because I've been studying it for years, and I'm yeah. in and out of all these organizations so I can, I can repeat yeah. what I'm seeing. 
but I'm always getting new ideas when I'm working with a salesperson, especially the good ones. Absolutely. Wonderful, Mike. So we'll, we'll go ahead and shift to our third segment. And, and I think maybe you'd be more angry on, on, on that one because it really has to do with how companies in general look at the sales organization and whether or not they set, they set this organization up for success. And I'd love to see if you've been through some client examples where that was the case and kind of take us from the before to the, to the after, if you will, sort of before and after scenario. Yeah, let me think about a good one for that. Um, I'm going to give you a, a, a good one. So a couple of years ago, um, this, this company was not setting its salespeople up for success. Highly visionary entrepreneur CEO trying to move the company into new markets with new solutions. Uh, veteran sales team, solid people. Um, because the CEO was so talented and so visionary and so charismatic, he was able to tell this story of um, what the market was going to look like down the road. Yes. And he could get a customer very interested in engaging their company to help them create this solution. Yes. Um, he could not understand, however, why his very senior, very expensive, very smart salespeople couldn't make the same things happen and they continued to struggle. And that's just one example of a, a sales team not set up to succeed. What this senior executive failed to realize is that his people were not him, even though they were smart and had been around a long time and were really good at selling, they needed a lot more clarity and a lot more direction and some more support than he did. He could sell ice to Eskimos with smoke and mirrors, yes. but most people need a story, a value proposition, uh, a, a plan to conduct a sales call. And I've seen that in more than one occasion. In fact, this was the first time I was able to actually point it out to a client because I had seen it somewhere else. Yes. He just couldn't get the fact that his, even though his people were really talented, they weren't as talented as he was. So there was a t I never see a sales attack succeed, particularly a new business sales attack, when there aren't two ingredients, focus and clarity. Clarity means we know what the heck we're selling and to whom we're selling it. You don't want salespeople making up strategy on the fly in the field. Their job is to execute strategy. Frankly, the reason I left my last company seven years ago yes. was because they couldn't, our, our business had changed and I was held accountable for trying to lead the sales team, but we didn't even know what we were selling and what the market was. And that's not a sales problem. That's a strategy problem. Exactly. So number one is clarity. Number two is focus, which means people have to do their day job. And you can, I'll, I'll take this to another client. Yes. I've, I, it's a company I'm working with right now. Um, very senior sales force, great product, great company, great legacy. They have grown really fast for a really long time. Uh, they brought me in there because they're, they're, they kind of plateaued. Yes. And after just a couple of visits and really just having conversations, what we discovered was that the salespeople were much more than salespeople. Uh, the type of business they had, the salespeople actually did all of the invoicing. It was custom projects and subscription work. It's hard to explain. Yes. Um, but it basically took over two full work days per month to do the month end custom invoicing for, for their clients. And I looked at the, the senior executive that was over the engagement and I said, part of the problem we're not selling more is because your salespeople are not spending enough time selling. Yes. And I know that sounds ridiculous and I can't believe I get paid the money I get paid to tell someone that. But the truth is that when you really look at all the other things this sales team did, maybe, maybe 40% of the time that was left was wow. available to do proactive selling. Right. Yeah. We're going to be pursuing new business at existing clients or most of what they were doing was service, follow-up, hand-holding, and invoicing. That's crazy. I love invoicing. I do my own invoicing. You know, I'm a small consulting yeah. firm, but there's no value in that. Yes. You know, if, if it took me two days a month, I wouldn't be doing it. Exactly. No, that, so it, that's another, if you, if we don't set them up to succeed, I had one client, different company, Texas, yes. uh, inside sales team, high, uh, call daily call volume activity goal. CEO wanted a lot of growth. They couldn't hit their activity goal. So I started going to their office and going, why can't you guys make these calls? Well, I followed them around for a couple hours. Yes. One guy gets up and he's going back to the plant to pull a certain kind of product out to get it over to shipping. I said, what are you doing? He goes, oh, on these type of orders, I have to go pull the order myself. Oh, wow. Okay. 
later in the day, a woman in the sales team was filling out all this paperwork for like a half hour to get an international shipment ready to go overseas for this really high-end product. I said, what are you doing? Yes. Said, Why are you not making calls? And she said, I have to do the international shipping. We do international shipping ourselves. So, you know, I go back to the general manager and go, well, I found the problem. Yes, right. Picking orders and international paperwork is not selling. So don't yell at me that your salespeople aren't hitting their goals when you have tasked them with all this other nonsense that's not going to move the revenue needle. So there's three different examples, three different companies of why salespeople not set up to succeed. Absolutely. That's, that's yeah. very interesting. And I think to your point, I mean, that's, that's the beauty of why, you, you know, you find the consulting work because sometimes it's staring them in the face and then someone needs to come in and point it out for them. Um, yeah. And that's why it's very important to get paid first in consulting. Yes. So you're not scared to tell someone, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm being funny, but I'm not really trying to be funny. Exactly. Yes. You get paid first because I don't want to, I don't want to have fear. And yeah. the beauty of being the outside consultant is you don't work there. You don't have to deal with the politics. And because you're only there for a short period of time, they still think you're smart. Absolutely. You know, once you work there or you hang around six months, you're not so smart anymore. You're just like everybody else. Yes. So you have a limited window to make an impact and getting paid first helps you tell the hard truth to the person who's paying you. Absolutely. And I think it's very gutsy from them when they, when they have finally decided that they need to bring Mike in is because they understand that, you know, part of it is they have to be open to listening to the hard truth. The, the stuff that they do not want to say to themselves, they could see it. But then when they say, you know, you know, our consultant came in and was telling us this information, then they have a third party verification of an issue that they already saw. Yeah. That's and you know what, Ash, mo most companies too, most of these people are great people. Yes. Most of these executives want to win and they don't want to be anti-sales and they don't, when they see the truth, they go, okay, I get it. It's, it's a very rare, arrogant moron who, who t hires you and then doesn't want to hear the advice. Absolutely. You know, most of them know they go, and, 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 and I'm coming off more brash and, and, and extreme in this conversation than yeah. obviously you would talking to someone who's, you're talking about their baby. And right. It's, exactly. You know, they're for a lot of folks in a, you know, a $50 million, $100 million company, it's their life. You know, it's, it's what they founded or they bought and they don't want to be told it's ugly. Yeah. So there's, you have to be nuanced. But at the same time, I've done this so many times that it's helpful when I can tell this, just like other people tell you, when I tell you, tell your story, yes. when I can share stories of other companies that have similar issues, that they're not alone. You know, I mean, if I have one more client call me and tell me, you know, here's the deal. We're doing a great job taking care of existing clients. My salespeople are complacent. They're not going out to hunt. I know they're making too much money babysitting the business that they have. I mean, I hear that once a week from somebody. Yes. And I'm like, yeah, I've read that book. Let me tell you how this plays out. Yeah. I mean, because it just, that's a common problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, wonderful, Mike. Uh, some of our listeners are basically trying to hold us to our promise uh, uh, when we talked about this webinar. And before we leave, they want to make sure they understand from you what is the most important sales weapon that you talk about in the, uh, in the book. Great. Thank you guys for holding us accountable. We appreciate that. I can get a little uh, excited and off topic. You have lots of weapons available to you as a salesperson, everything from social media to referrals, to your executives, to marketing material, um, to, re to references, to presentations, white papers, videos, testimonials, how you do a sales call, how you pick up the phone. All those weapons are available for you to launch at your targets. By far, by far, your single most important weapon is your sales story. It's the words that come out of your mouth yeah. or that end up in your email or voicemail. And the reason your story is the most important is because bits and pieces of your story end up in every other weapon. Your story is in your LinkedIn profile. Your story yeah. is in your voicemail. Your story is in your PowerPoint slide. Your story is in your proposal. So you better darn well have a good story. And I said this earlier, but I want to repeat it. Yes. The three biggest sins when salespeople tell their story, they are boring. And the reason they're boring often is because they're self-focused. It's we do this and we do that and we do the other thing and we're the best. And like I said earlier, we've been, yes. we're made in America. We've been in business a hundred years. Nobody cares. Exactly. So it's, we're boring. We're self-focused. And the third reason is we're too complicated. It should not take you 10 PowerPoint slides or an entire brochure to explain your story. If in 20, 30, 40 seconds, you can't tell someone the issues you address for your clients and why they come to you and a couple reasons that you're different, yeah. you've got a problem.
And, and what I just really shared with you are the, the two most important parts of your story. And all of this is in, is in chapter eight in New Sales Simplified. You have three elements to your story. You have the issues you address for customer, their pains, problems, opportunities, outcomes. You have what you sell, which yeah. is your offering, what you actually write invoices for. Yes. And then you have your differentiators. So you have customer issues, offerings, and differentiators. Most salespeople lead with their offerings, which is why they get commoditized and why they don't get people's attention. Some salespeople do a better job bragging about why they're better and different. And you know what? I'll give them some credit for being creative. But the truth is, you take a lot of risk when you lead with your differentiators because you can come off like a braggart. And what you're bragging about may be totally irrelevant to the person you're talking to. But if you start your story with the issues that are on their mind, what they've been challenged with, their corporate uh, initiatives, um, their pressure, the desired outcomes they want to achieve, the pains they want to remove. If you start your story like that, immediately, not only does their defense come down and be willing to talk to you, but it elevates how they see you because you're talking like someone who addresses those issues for your other customers and they immediately think, oh, you help them. Maybe you could help us. Let's talk to each other. It's a whole lot more strategic conversation as well. Yeah, and that's the best in this venue. That's the best I can explain the importance of the story. And I'll just say this. It's, it's your important, most important weapon because it ends up in all of your other weapons. But here's yeah. the other thing. I don't know how you could sell, especially how you could prospect for new business, if you don't love your story. Yes. I'll talk to any executive because I know what I'm going to say in the first 10 seconds. They're going to go, huh, interesting. Tell me more. Tell me more, exactly. And if you don't have a story like that in your business, you better figure out, what are the three, four, five big issues that are on the mind of your customer? And you need to lead with those when you start talking. Absolutely. Mike, I, you know, I, I've been following you for a while, and I, and I can see how much business you're getting and how busy you are. But I want to make sure we plan to see the people listening to the conversation. If someone or a company or a sales team wanted to engage with Mike, mm -hmm. how should they go about it? And what should they expect the process to flow? to the point that they now have you with them, working with them and helping them exchange. I appreciate you asking that question, Ash, thank you. Uh, and this has been a fun, fun conversation with you. Um, I'm intentionally keeping my business uh, relatively small. Yes. I have just a handful of employees and I'm not interested in building a, a larger firm today with a bunch of junior associates. So um, I'm very careful about which longer term engagements I take on. I do a lot of short-term project consulting, and then I do a handful of longer engagements. Um, but I, my brain and my calendar, on top of all the speaking I'm doing where I'm training and flying around, if people want me to talk at their meeting from the books, exactly. I have to, I, it's limited. So generally the process starts with, like every other good sales uh, process, a good discovery conversation. And uh, I, I probably choose to work with one-tenth of the, the leads I actually get between being priced out of the market because I'm – pretty darn high because yeah. of the amount of demand. Um, yeah. And the fact that I only want to work with a company where I know I'm going to make a difference. I specialize in B2B and I want to work in places where they want to make changes. And you can tell sometimes in the first hour of a, a relationship, whether there's chemistry and you think you're going to enjoy working together because no amount of money is worth working with someone that's going to torture you. Yes. And I have fired clients just like everyone else has, because if they're not, if it's not a good fit and they're not interested, why are we going through the motions? Exactly, yeah. So I have limited opportunities to work with me from a consulting perspective, and it's, it's, it's good for both sides if we really talk it through and, and talk through what are the big objectives and what could this look like? Because I'm not a franchisee, and I didn't buy some system that, I'm gonna, that I teach. It's my stuff. Yes. And the truth is, in most real engagements, by the time I'm in month two or month three, we've changed so many things from what we thought we were going to do. Because when you dig in and you start meeting people and going on sales calls and asking hard questions, you learn what's really going on, exactly. which is much more enlightening than what you saw when you were writing the proposal. Yeah, discovery call, yeah, exactly. Right. So you know, you, so real people adapt as they go. Yes. Um, speaking, I have, you know, I'm limiting my speaking right now to three engagements a month because I can't. I just don't want to live on airplanes like I've been doing. And the best way to someone get, you know. Hit my website. I just put a, a new website up. Lots of speaking samples, lots of audio um, examples of podcasts. And if, if they like it, shoot us a, a note, contact us, and we'll talk through availability and if, if it's a good fit or not. So thanks for asking. 
Wonderful, Mike. So I definitely want to encourage everyone listening in and, and people who will be listening to this on the Top 1% Sellers Academy, buy Mike's books and much more importantly, I hope you get the opportunity to work with Mike and leverage some of his expertise as he sees clients across the board and works with sales teams across the board of issues that basically come up and really he helps them with that transformation. Mike, it's been a pleasure to have you here on the Top 1% Sellers Academy webinar and I look forward to speaking with you soon again. Uh, you're, you're a gentleman and you're very generous, Ash. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with your audience. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon.